Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Ramakrishnan, the Director and Chief Mentor of ARK Academy of Higher Education Training and ARK AIS Academy. This is a part of our knowledge series. In continuation the really lecture, today we'll have the second part of the lecture. The theme of the lecture is we will discuss or deliberate about the recently placed the Electricity Amendment Bill 2022. We'll discuss on that. And before starting, today being Teacher's Day, let me recall the great contribution done by my teachers. I am always greatly indebted and grateful to them for my teachers who played a leading role. But for them, I am not here. So I am extremely happy to wish my teachers on this day. Now since we have, I made it a point to touch upon one of the greatest classical literature, which will give a great insight in the way human humanity has progressed, in the way humanity has contributed for a period of centuries. Today we are going to discuss about one of the one of the, one of the classic play, one of the classic Greek tragic play written by. Aeschylus, who lived in Greek from 525 to 456 before Common Era, is dramatic in classical tragedies. I have taken his one of the greatest play, Prometheus Bound. We'll discuss about this play. In the Greek mythology, Prometheus is a titan, a god himself, defying Zeus, the king of gods, and brought in fire to the mankind, for which, as he has revolted, so he was punished, and he and the king of God, Jews, asked Vulcan to nail him on the cliff. And the myth goes that every day the eagle comes on and eat Prometheus' liver, which regenerates. That's a kind of enduring pain he has to withstand on a daily basis. Now let us look at the play, the conversation of the play, a very a small, a brief I thought I will touch upon. For the simple reason, I won't really excite the students' community to really go into the play and read. Only by reading this kind of fiction or this kind of the human element, we can be a great leader or aspire for greater things in life. This we'll read. I'll read for the sake of reading. The chorus leader, did you perhaps go further than you have told us? Prometheus says, I cast mortals to cease forcing death. To cease forcing death, that's what he talks about. I'll unattend it. What cure did he provide against that sickness? So how you made them to not cease forcing that. He told, he's telling, Prabhupada is telling, a place of blind hopes. He gives hopes. Hope is the primary driver of the humanity. Then the chorus leader tells, there was indeed a great benefaction that you gave to martyrs. That Prometheus tell, besides this, he also gave a fire, he also gave a fire. 
I did on purpose. I shall not deny it. In helping martyrs, I brought pain on myself. As a titan, as a god himself, he defied his own gods. And he felt he is revolted. In that sense, Prometheus, against autocracy, we can interpret it anyway. In multiple ways, we can interpret it. He defied them. I did on purpose. That is consciously a second it. I shall deny it. In helping martyrs, I brought pain on myself. But yet, I did not think that with such tortures as these, I should be withered on the sleeves. Goes on. The play goes on. I request the students' community, the public, please read the play and share it and reread it. Well, as I discussed in the previous lecture, we should always have a the perspective, the historical perspective, in order to understand any event or interconnection. Why something is evolving? Is then only we can look into it in an objective way. That's a, that's the basic purpose. The electricity as a bill was introduced in two thousand one. I'll try to. Okay, you can see here the bill was introduced in two thousand one, and it became an act in two thousand three. Then it was amended later. Only one amendment has come. The bill was introduced in 2005 and it became Electricity Amendment Act 2007. And from 2014 onwards, 14, 18, 20, now the present, multiple times it was, it was placed in the parliament twice, 2014 and now 2022. Between 2018 and 20, the draft was circulated. And this electricity amendment 2014 got lapsed due to the dissolution of the 16th Lok Sabha. Now let's look at if you look at the, the, the criticality or the core essence of the act was it started subsuming the various electricity acts prevailing at the point of time. One is the Electricity Act of 1910, then the Electricity Supply Act of 1948, and the Electricity Regulatory Commission Act 1998. If you look at the main aims of, apart from consolidation, consolidation of what? Consolidation relating to the generation, the transmission, and distribution of electricity. And they want to develop the industry as a whole, electricity industry as a whole. They felt for the main aim of this act. And apart from this, the aim is to promote competition and protecting the interests of consumers. And the primary objective is electricity is a prime driver of the growth of the economy. So the supply of electricity has to go to the all areas. And also talked about the electricity tariff has to be rationalized. What is the meaning of rationalization? We look at it. What, what is rationalization? To put it in a simpler way, here the act talks about rationalization, the cost of production or the cost of supply of electricity has to meet the cost of generation, including it varies losses, transmission losses, and any distribution losses. So the average revenue has to meet the supply cost. That they talk about rationalization. And they established a central electricity authority and various commissions, the appellate tribunal, any appeal has to go through this tribunal. These are the overall view about the electricity act. It made a major breakthrough in terms of consolidating various acts. And what was the impact of the act? We look at it. 
and even before being an act as a bill, it went to a study committee, which we, which we have seen. Though it was in 2001, it went to a study committee for examining it. We look at it. Now, before that, what is it? Because unless until we know a certain terminology, a certain the purpose in which they want to address this act or the current bill which is placed, we cannot appreciate in totality. We know that there is a generation element. The power has to be generated any part. It can be any kind of generation. It can be fossil, non-fossil, non-fossil like a renewable energy source. It can be hydrogen, it can be solar, it can be wind, or even ocean tides, anything. And here we have generation. It can be from nuclear power, it can be thermal power, it can be. The generation is transmitted. Normally, as, as we discussed, the power, unless it, immediately it has to be generated, it has to be transmitted. The storage has to, can be done only on a, on a minuscule basis, the kind of comparative generation. You have a transmission, then a distributor to meet the end user requirement. Distribution to domestic, agriculture, industry, various commercial sectors. Now the, the various acts are even before this even act came into being in 2003, all were vertically integrated. Take the case of Terminator Electricity Port. GNEB had a generator, they were the transmitter, they were the distributor. Absolutely no private place. But for evacuating, because in that time also we had wind as a whole, start evacuating. We introduce a concept of wheeling charges that we'll discuss later, or you should understand. Now, the post 2003, that stipulates that if, if end user, a consumer whose requirement is greater than megawatt, can directly from open access, we use a word called open access, can directly consume power from the generator. Wherever it is. So this is called vertical unbundling. Unbundling is you bundle out. What you're bundling out? Generation remove it, transmission remove it, distribution remove it. Initially, this initially the generation has been unbundled. Oh, and we were going to look at Indian scenario. How this unbundling of generation happen? What is the what is the generation capacity of central, state, and private industry? Then horizontal unbundling, we should understand what is the meaning of horizontal unbundling. This horizontal sector, so assume that you go to a distribution, which they call as a discount distribution companies. Or corporates. Which you call it. So you, you, you are having a horizontal, but you have you, you, you make multiple players enter into a particular a vertical. So because we are total vertical three, you dismantle generation, transmission, distribution. And among distribution, you allow multiple players to enter. That's called horizontal unbundling. The main objective or the main principle, which even the earlier draft bill or the present bill talks about, when you have multiple plays in the system, that will help in two parameters. One is you have a choice. They emphasize that. When more players are there in the market, the customer, the end user, has a choice of 
obtaining the particular service or goods and service at the price in which he feels it's very competitive or affordable so that they promote a concept called horizontally and vertically so we got we have to learn three one is vertical integrated existing scenario slightly uh, like uh, generation has been and bundle vertical and bundling and horizontal and bundling one particular sector is further and bundle you have multiple ways hope you can understand this you can appreciate because then only you can appreciate the following act because an act has to be read in all this uh, with, with this kind of thoughts and the kind of basic knowledge little bit annotated where you can see there is a policy making you got a regulators because once you got set a policy but you have to regulate it when there is system operators here with system operators being electricity sector you need a load dispatch center similarly you got a region load dispatch centers and state load dispatch centers based upon generation and transmission and distribution so the, the three components come into play there may be an uneven generation of particular things. but conception may be different so you need a system operator steps in to monitor that then you got a generation which you know transmission and distribution you can see here three players already the central state and private sector and you got a central state and private sector transmission distribution state sector and private dist sector distribution licensee then you got a markets markets is a power exchange where you trade in power in order to meet the sudden demand or a drop in generation they all be the state sector distribution state licensee comes down you get to the power exchanges or you got a trading licensee then bilateral markets this is a overview about the structure of the electric sector let's try to understand this we'll move to the next yeah now we had a, a brief backdrop about the initial act and the various the concepts and the fundamental knowledge required to understand that that was our basic uh, learning process which i felt it's required to understand a bill or act now i want to highlight a point one of the one of the very critical which is even highlighted even during the tabling of bill 2022 that is this is an extract from the standing committee on energy 2002 the electricity bill was 2001 it was present in lok sabha in 19 december 2002 as we know the bill was went to standing committee and standing committee presented then on further deliberation it became an act in 2003 like what we are discussing now in 2022 also it was highlighted what was the point of highlighting or what we even in the previous lecture we discussed about the bill 2020 the electricity amendment bill 2022 it violates the constitution now we will look at even 2001 when the bill was tabled similar tone it is objected stating that violates so what does it violate now we will look at indian constitution 
the legislative powers being a federal polity you got a central you got a central union list then you got a state list then you got a concurrent list now this electricity let me try to annotate it electricity comes under entry number 38 electricity it is coming list 3 list 1 is union list 2 state and list 3 is concurrent list the constitution gives the plenary powers to the union and state to legislate on their own domain of operation then what is a concurrency comes what is concurrent we'll discuss it see as a part of as an academician i felt that these are all some of the prerequisite or i want you to put you on the same level of plane or the same level of understanding to really appreciate the bill or an act or any any policy making So we'll start elaborating on some basic concepts of electricity, the structure, and what is bundling and unbundling. Then I want to put you on this constitution perspectiveness to understand about the opposition parties are making objection to the bill, stating that it violates. so this was this the standing committee posed this question that being the entry number 38 and it concurrent list should not the state to be consulted so when this question was posed the ministry of law at that point of time you should understand 2000 bill 2001 2023 till 2004 it was india government headed by then prime minister mr vajpayee so ministry of law the express their opinion that the parliament has full powers to legislate on the subjects of electricity which falls under the concurrent list and uh, union law in respect of subject enumerated in the concurrent list shall prevail over state law if at all there is a state law then the union law can prevail upon to the extent of repugnancy is very important between the two article 254 clause 2 of the constitution of india now as a student or maybe the policy makers as to browse upon as to have a in depth reading of what is this seventh schedule entry number 38 concurrent list and article 242 which the ministry of law is express that they have the powers they have the they can legislate there is a committee I made an observation. The present bill has been brought forward to take measures conducive to the development of electricity. So when we talk about conducive to the development of electricity, we need active cooperation of the state as a prerequisite and become absolute necessary. So the cooperation of the state is a prerequisite, absolute necessary. and also they talked about the standing committee also highlighted that keeping in view the federal structure of polity the state should be given enough flexibility to design on the matter of subjects which is a concurrent list of the constitution which is in the concurrent list because if in state list the state has all the powers to legislate and this be concurrent the flexibility should be given also to the state and the active cooperation from the state is a prerequisite 
that's it. This was highlighted by the standing committee. And the similar request has also been made by the, the present opposition parties. We we'll let's see how does it turn out. But if you look at the standing committee's response of the standing committee's response on the ministerial plan, you say. Now, even we're going to look at the bill tabled in 2014, it got lapsed. A similar stand has been taken by the Ministry of Law. They have all the legislative programs. Then how to overcome them. And how to look at it. Or is any way, is all, all the, does all the concurrent list has only union is going to legislate. We have to look at it from the constitutional perspective. Anyway, this discussion on debating on this bill, I'm making a limiting clause. The objective of this entire session, we are not going to, I want to highlight or I want to really make you to raise all these questions. But detailed discussion is not in the purview of this discussion, in the sense. We can have a separate session on that to look at how does this the federal polity behaves? How does this concurrent list? How does the union and state jointly, as the committee has talked about, active cooperation with the state? The now, even before getting to the concurrent, it felt the students or the policy or the any who is interested in the public policy making should really understand what is the meaning of concurrent. That is the reason for putting it to slide. Because as I talked about, in order to have an objective analysis, objective understanding. We should have the basic academic rigor to go into the depth of understanding, right from the fundamentals. I cannot assume you know everything. That is the reason for the slide. Let's try to understand what is the meaning of definition of concurrent for many websites. I've chosen only website. Even Supreme Court, very judgment, they also use websites. If you look at here, it is operating or occurring at the same time. So concurrent means operating or occurring at the same time, running parallel, exercise over the same matter or area by two different authorities. The concurrent means exercise over the same matter. The concurrent powers are everywhere like being electricity, entry number 38 in Schedule 7. So we have two powers, both union as well as state, two different authorities. So that is meaning of concurrent. Then we have, there is one more wording which is called repugnance. Let's try to understand what is repugnance. Repugnance, we will be reading because Article 254, Clause 2 talks about that. The quality or fact of being contradictory or inconsistent. Repugnancy is nothing but the quality or fact of being contradictory or inconsistency. An instance of such contradiction or inconsistency. So there is an element of inconsistency. That's all repugnancy. So hope you can understand, hope you can appreciate. Because I don't want you to take it for granted in definition, granted for any meaning. You should really understand the meaning of the word. We'll go to the next. Okay. So now I want you to read or understand the Article 254. 
it talks about they can't it inconsistency between laws made by parliament and laws made by the legislative states so article 254 the indian constitution talks about there is an element of inconsistency so which the framers of the constitution anticipated by in having an element of concurrency it felt there will be an element of inconsistency between the laws made by the parliament and the legislators now let's try to re read this act this article article 2542 in the constitution clause 2 254 clause 1 i'm not deliberating for this presentation so here we let's try to understand that a law made by the legislature of a state with the respect to one of the matters enumerated in the concurrent list now we know concurrent the meaning of concurrent we now only we understood the last line any provision repugnant to the provisions of an earlier law made by parliament or an existing law with the respect to that matter then the law so made by the legislative state shall if it has been reserved for the consideration of the president and has received his assent prevail in the state it means that you, you should try to understand the law has been made by the legislative any of the matters enumerated in the concurrent list number 1 the law has been made mean by the law so we have to understand the significance of this mean only legislating body makes a law judiciary doesn't make a law that goes part of the judgment itself which you are going to see here it contains any provision repugnant to the provisions of either law made by parliament suppose a state make some but if there is going to be any provision repugnant to the provision repugnant what inconsistency which we discussed here in the parliament or an existing law with respect to that matter then the law so made by the list of such state shall if it has been reserved for the consideration of the president and received his assent prevail in the state state in act law but there is a limit of repugnancy but if it has been reserved for the consideration of the president and has received his assent prevail in the state so when the law though there is repugnancy when it can provide it can provide in the particular state when the law has received the president assent but further the clause extends but nothing in the clause shall prevent parliament from enacting at any time any law with respect to the same matter including the law a law adding to amending varying or repealing the law so made with the legislative of the state so it doesn't prevent a parliament we are been acting any time for what adding amending repealing the law so i want the students committed to really deliberate on this do i thought i have highlight this for the limited purpose of trying to understand does this bill violates the constitution because it forms part of the concurrent list where the states with the opposition parties feels that they are not been consulted or union is encroaching upon the court that's a federal court now let's look at the concurrency the part in other countries constitution 
how it has been handled like our article 254 clause 2 just we read though if you look at united states constitution the federal polity only the concurrency they don't have any concurrent powers but but after the amendment after the 18th amendment this element was introduced this has been discussed in the united states supreme court state of road island versus park in 1920 I have taken this text of the 18th Amendment. The amendment banned all call the United States. It was proposed by Congress in 1917 and ratified in 1918 in the Supremes. And I have taken only second section. Not really understand the concurrency, how other Supreme Court has debated, and deliberated, and given judgment. We are going to look at other countries how the Constitution handles this concurrency. not really this will give the the students or the policy makers how others are really looking at this concurrence this section 2 talks about the congress and the several state shall have the military authority the congress and the several states shall have concurrent power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation the us constitution never had any concurrent power only this after this 18th amendment was introduced but you should also understand this entire amendment was ripped the 21st amendment let's try to understand i i will take the brief wording from the judgment here the judgment talks about the words concurrent power in this section do not mean joint power there is no joint power or require that legislation there and there by congress to be effective shall be approved or sanctioned by the several states or any so the concurrent power is not a joint power is not a joint power this happened this judgment supreme court judgment is from 1920 where our constitution came later so it is not joint is not a joint power concurrency nor do they mean that is divided between the congress and the states then how to go about it i am not getting the judgment detail but i want you to really highlight the fact that how they define concurrency is not a joint power at the same time nor do they mean that the power to enforce is divided between congress and the states So here, I have taken Australia's constitution. It it has passed as part of the British Act of Parliament, nineteen hundred, and took effect on first January nineteen o one. Though the state parliaments can pass laws on wide range of subjects in the Commonwealth Parliament, but The section would not nine has a it shows a commonwealth can prevail upon state. Let me read it. When the law of a state is inconsistent with the law of the commonwealth, the la- the latter shall prevail, and the former shall. to the extent of the inconsistency be invalid so here also come the inconsistency the repugnancy the so section 109 of australia's constitution discuss about the relationship between commonwealth and state powers so here also when the inconsistency is there between state law and the commonwealth then the law of the commonwealth provides canada's constitution act 1867 they also have concurrent powers of legislation respecting agriculture 
So section 95 talks about little many doubt. In each province, the legislature will make, may make laws in relation to agriculture in the province and to immigration into the province. And it is here we declared that the Parliament of Canada may from time to time make laws in relation to agriculture in all or any of the provinces and to immigration into all or any of the provinces. And any law of the legislature of the province relative to agriculture or to immigration shall have effect in and for the province as long and as far only as it is not repugnant to any act of the party. So they can make laws, but as long as that, it is not repugnant to any act of parliament. Section 95 of Canada's Constitution Act 1867. So we should understand that both constitution gave a lot of discussion in our constitutional assembly debates. Today, let us uh, close the session. Well, let us try to recall. Initially, we touched upon the Electricity Act 2003 and what is the role of the Standing Committee? Uh, how does the Standing Committee discuss about Article 254, Clause 2, where they go to legislative purpose? Because this was amplified in the present bill, was stable in the parliament that. So, I then we touched upon. The article. Then you know to appreciate how other nations look at this concurrency and this repugnancy. There also be discussed. In the next session, we'll discuss about some of the some of the important Supreme Court judgments about this Article 254 Clause 2 in terms of concurrent powers, in terms of repugnancy. Then we'll take up the 2007 Act and 2014 the Bill. So it will give a overview about to understand. So I request you to mail a tweet the sessions my mailing at academy2022 at gmail.com. Or you can Twitter at me. Here can use Academy can Twitter to help me in reaching you, help me into refining my discussion. Though I normally I really touch upon the fundamentals. Unless you don't have a grounding on the fundamentals, you cannot build an academic career. That's a basic objective. Have a good day. We'll meet in the coming days. Thank you.